Hello doctors, welcome to Chennai Women's Clinic and Scan Centre's Dialogue Series. This is a part of our initiative to leverage technology to best serve the medical community through healthy debates and discussions. I am Dr. Deepthi Jami, Consultant Fetal Medicine at Chennai Women's Clinic and Scan Centre. Today we have got young eminent gynecologist from Chennai, Dr. Nithya Ramachandran who is a postgraduate from Government Medical College Kotayam who is currently practicing at Sims Hospital, Motherhood and Cloud9 Chennai. Her special interests include endoscopic surgeries. We have Dr. Kritika Kaushik, who is a postgraduate from Bangalore Medical College and Southern Railway Headquarters, who is currently practicing in Jane Group of Hospitals and Cloud9 Chennai. Her special interest would include high-risk obstetrics. We have Dr. Anusha Raj with us, who is a postgraduate from Institute of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Moore, a part of Madras Medical College, currently practicing at Sims, Medway Hospitals and Cloud9 Chennai. Her special interest would include endoscopic surgeries and high-risk obstetrics. So Dr. Kritika, do you remember recently we uh, saw a patient last week. Would you want to elaborate on the case history of the patient? Yes, Titi. We saw a 22-year-old pregnant mother who came to you for her routine anomaly scan and you called our team saying she has a short cervix. Nitya, what would you want to do? Yeah, I remember the case, Kritika. So I would like to know a detailed obstetric history about the patient. That is, did she have any previous miscarriages or was it a second trimester miscarriage or was it a preterm delivery before 34 weeks or did she have any rupture of membranes? And apart from that, is this the first time we have documented short cervix or is it a progressively shortening cervix? And the, of course, the other fetal parameters. Mm -hmm. So having said all this, Deepthi, can you tell us how do we look at the, in TVS or in TS, how do we document a short cervix? Okay. Uh, see, routinely as we all know, as gynecologists, we know that cervical length is a must in any anomaly screening. So it's a part of a routine targeted ultrasound at right. the trimester. It can be done both ways. One is transabdominal screening, the other one is transvaginal. Uh, transabdominal screening, we have to make sure that the bladder is partly filled. It should neither be fully filled or empty because that will determine the length of the cervix. Falsely, you, might, you can get a longer cervix or even a shorter cervix. So, so the best method, I would say, is to do a transvaginal ultrasound. So say when you talk about transvaginal ultrasound, I would want to insist that it should be an empty bladder obviously and with a sterile transvaginal probe covered with a probe cover and jelly so that it's not very painful to the patient. Right. Counsel them what you're actually going to do at, in a transvaginal ultrasound probably that's the first time they're actually going to get a transvaginal ultrasound also. So when you insert the probe make sure you don't put a lot of pressure in because you might encounter myometrial contractions. So if you see myometrial contractions make sure that you wait for some time for the contractions to go away settle down and then measure the cervix. Don't go deep inside. Just pull the probe one or two centimeters away. Make sure you visualize the entire cervical length. The cervical length is measured from the point of the internal loss to the external loss. And the point of internal loss is where the bladder takes off. The angle of the bladder deviation is the internal loss. And make sure that the measurement is correct. So that's how we routinely do a cervical length screening. And in this patient, we saw only short cervix. That is, short cervix is anywhere less than 2.5 centimeters. Uh, so when we see a short cervix, our next uh, thing what we want to see is whether it's an opening of an internal loss is there or not. That is the next thing which we want to see. So you need to spend time, minimum, there is no set protocol how much we need to spend time, but then at least minimum two to five minutes, we will have to spend time to see if that short cervix is actually opening or not, because that will give us a clue for what management we have to do. So in case, in this case, the internal loss was closed and there, was, there wasn't any dynamic changes in the cervix. But many a times we come across when the cervix is open. So what do we do when the cervix is open? We see that the funneling length, then the width of the funnel, those two are very important. One more important factor is the remaining length of the cervix. Because the remaining length of the cervix is what I, I hope will help you take a decision of whether you're going to put a cervical encerclage for the patient or right. not. Apart from all this which we routinely see, we have to mention about the presence of sludge because sludge is nothing but collection of debris in front of the cervix. So the presence of sludge will definitely inform you whether the patient is at high risk for developing a chorionionitis or not. 
uh, thank you Deepthi for enlightening us on that. And uh, regarding the management, I would like to call this patient after two weeks. Because as you said, the cervix is short and the os is closed. So I think calling her after two weeks is fair enough. Mm -hmm. Dithya, uh, we got the information that uh, we have a patient with short cervix. There is no funneling, internal os is also not open. Is there a role for progesterone here? Yes, Anu, definitely there is a role for progesterone. Uh, because uh, according to the trials, progesterone definitely helps in prolonging the delivery till about 34 weeks. And uh, the mechanism of action of progesterone would be, uh, it is an anti-inflammatory agent as we all know. And uh, there are various kinds of progesterone which we give. And uh, progesterone decreases the sensitivity of oxytocin to its receptors. So that is the way it helps in prolonging, uh, prolonging the delivery prolonging the delivery and the progesterone which we give are either intramuscular or oral or vaginal and the selection of patients and it depends on uh, our practice or our experience on what method of progesterone we would like to give. Okay, she comes back after two weeks with the same finding. Will the management differ? What would, what would we do further? Um, see, there is no harm in waiting. But uh, uh, we have seen a lot of practitioners do giving progesterone. So I think it is a 50-50 and it's still a debatable topic whether we have to give progesterone or we can just pull through. But good practice point is to give progesterone. Mm -hmm. That's right. Nitya, this is a single cell mother. What if this mother was carrying twin pregnancy? Would your management differ? Uh, definitely. I think, Ritika, you are, you're, asking, you're referring to whether we have to put a cervical stitch or not. Uh, see, we don't have any relevant evidence to tell that cervical stitch would help. So my answer would be no, because we don't have a still a large randomized trials, we don't have whether we have to tell, give a cervical stitch or not. Irrespective of cervix being short, mm -hmm. uh, the patient with the multiple gestation would be monitored frequently. Mm -hmm. So Deepthi, can you tell us more about that? How often you want to see the patient? See, uh, fetal surveillance, that antenatal uh, fetal surveillance in, in multiple pregnancy will definitely depend on the chorionicity. So, if we talk about chorionicity, obviously we will know from scans whether it's going to be a dichorionic twin or a monochorionic twin. And in case of a dichorionic twin, after our initial first trimester screening and a routine target at ultrasound, where we are going to uh, see the cervical length as early as in the first trimester, the mid, mid second early trimester, that was I mean by 16 to 18 weeks, we would, few practitioners do want to check the cervical length to, be, right. make, uh, to make sure whether the cervix is shortening or not. And ultimately, when the patient comes back to us for a targeted ultrasound, say around 20 weeks, that's the first time or the few times we have seen a cervical length. From there onwards, depending on the chorionicity, in case if it's a dichorionic twin, we are going to call her back monthly once. And if we, if it's going to be a monochorionic twin, obviously once in every fortnight, that is once in every two weeks. Nitya, will increase in BMI defer management? Like, will there be any intense surveillance protocol or... Anything different that we are going to do with a normal right. BMI? See, increase in increase or reduction in cervical length is not going to depend on the patient's weight or on the BMI. So when, but definitely high BMI is associated with other medical complications. So that might lead to preterm labor and not necessarily the cervix being short. Mm -hmm. okay. So Deepthi, how difficult it is for you to screen the patients for short cervix mm -hmm. with high BMI? So actually cervical screening, uh, it's much better than a routine anomaly screening because right. we have a liberal use of transvaginal ultrasound. So there isn't much that we are actually going to lose by uh, uh, obesity or a high BMI. So uh, we tend to not to use a transabdominal ultrasound, at least in the early pregnancy, because trans uh, uh, transvaginal measurement of cervical length is the most accurate matter. And uh, obviously the high BMI is not going to be a factor in uh, transvaginal uh, ultrasound. Kritika, would you want to just sum up in the case, like how yes, uh, yes. we went about this case and how we managed this patient? Yes, of course, Stipti. Uh, this patient, uh, we actually followed her up, mm -hmm. gave her progesterone support yeah. Yeah. for two weeks. I remember, yeah. And when she came back to you for a follow-up scan, there was a progressive shortening of yeah. the cervix and the decision was taken to stitch her up immediately. We continued progesterone support for her. Mm. Right. And yeah. then she went on to deliver at term, yeah. a 2.8 right. kg male baby. And uh, she is now in her second pregnancy as well. So finally, we have a few points to note. Point number one is that in any mother who has a prior history of preterm loss and an apparent shortening of the cervix, mm -hmm. we offer vaginal progesterones or a cervical stitch. In a mother with no previous history, but there is a definite shortening of cervix, especially between 16 to 24 weeks of pregnancy, mm -hmm. we can support her with vaginal progesterones. So... 
here you go so you heard it right so when we the main point over here what we want to convey as a team is that if you find a mother with a previous history of either a mid trimester loss or cervical trauma or a previous say history of a cervical incompetence and also coming with a short cervix in the present pregnancy obviously the idea would be to stitch it up am i right so yeah. um but in case you're seeing a young primary like how was in our case you can very well manage her with a vaginal or progesterone in whatever route right. you are say progesterone supplementation and they do do well because we do have trials that say that vaginal progesterone supplementation will take them up till term and you deliver a healthy baby not that everyone ends up with a preterm labor so that's the main point we wanted to uh, bring it out in this discussion as well as when you get a trans vaginal ultrasound report say there's a cervical incompetence i think we should look into parameters like cervical length remainder cervical, cervical length what is the width of the funnel uh, how much is it actually funneling and the presence of sludge so these are the take home points if you want to know yes if you want to know more information please visit www.chennaiwomensclinic.com you can also subscribe to us at facebook instagram or youtube if you want to write to us please do write to us in our number 733 8771733 and we'll get back to you thank you